Risks to the economy are now balanced, the Fed says, and they're no longer talking about raising rates. But do not expect cuts soon. No change in rates today. And the statement drops the reference to additional policy firming, now saying, quote, in considering any adjustments to the target range, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. But before you buy March futures, the statement goes on to say, the committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. Officials say the economy is solid, job gains remain strong, and the committee judges that risks to achieving its employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. Inflation, however, has eased over the past year but remains elevated, the statement says. The economic outlook is uncertain and the committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks. There is no change to balance sheet policy, nor does the statement suggest any changes are imminent. The Fed will keep the $60 billion cap on Treasury roll-offs and the $35 billion cap on mortgage bonds. The decision today, unanimous. And one other bit of business, the Fed has extended its, tight, its tighter policies on investment and trading to senior staff and any staff with access to confidential information. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Let's get to the price action immediately and look at equities. Equities on the S&P 500, just a touch lower by almost 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 1.4. If you just turn to the bond market briefly, yields were lower by about 10 basis points to the front end. Now 425.61. That move face just a little bit. So, Lisa, let's go through what we got here. We've dropped the tightening bias, but not a full embrace of the rate cut conversation taking place on Wall Street. And there's a little bit of disappointment, clearly, that you can see on the front end with people uh, maybe thinking they would lean into a March rate cut saying not thinking anytime soon, highly attentive to inflation risks. That focus may be casting a bit of cold water on some of the hopes and dreams. The TK down five basis points on the 10-year, just short of 4% here at about 398. Coming a little move here, John. And you know, I still say we're, we're radically different from where we were earlier this morning or even days and days ago. Yes, we've pulled back a little bit. It'll be interesting to see the press conference, to say uh, the least. This is well-timed. Joining us now is Richard Clarida. He is with PIMCO, their global economic advisor. He's the former vice chair of the Fed and far more associated forever with his Columbia at University. Richard Clarida, Ethan Harris, student of Columbia, Ex-Bank of America wrote a brilliant piece off his hero at Columbia, Phil Kagan, the other day. And he said, we've blown it on our inflation studies. We've got to get on trend. And for him, the trend is the Dallas Tribune, the Cleveland Median, and the rest of it. What is the trend right now, Professor Clarida, in inflation? Well, thank you for having me on, uh, Tom. Uh, good friend of Ethan, and, and Phil Kagan was a colleague and a friend for many years. Uh, I look at Dallas Fed trimmed uh, mean two. It's running somewhere in the mid twos on inflation. That's down a lot from a couple of uh, years ago, but still obviously somewhat above the Fed's long run goal of, of 2%. But I think that's a good reading right now. Rich, when you look at the pushback, and it is subtle pushback in this statement, why do you think this Federal Reserve is not quite prepared to fully embrace that rate cut conversation taking place on Wall Street? Well, on this one, John, I, I actually agree with them. Uh, I, I myself, looking at the data they're looking at, would have thought March would be uh, too, too soon. We don't get a lot more data in March than we have uh, today. Moreover, as, as you've pointed out on air, and I've been, been watching, uh, you know, there is still some upside risk on the inflation uh, picture. So I just think good policy uh, prudence would call for getting more information. And I applaud what they did in the statement today. They did. I don't have it in front of me. I read Mike's uh, account. Looks like there's a lot of red ink in it. And I think that made sense today. Yeah, especially with that particular uh, comment, the committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target rate until it has gained greater confidence that inflation uh, is moving sustainably toward 2%. I'm wondering, Rich, do you think that the New York Community Bank Corp issue changes the equation, even on the margins for the Fed? And if you are on the Fed, for you? Given what I know right now, Lisa, I would say... Not, but I do think that the reality is is that uh, you know we have a number of regional banks uh, in the U.S. You know, above 100 billion, but not in that mega 
uh, uh, category, and the Fed, Fed did what it needed to do last uh, spring, and I have no doubt that, that they will be there if further uh, is needed. So I'd say right now, this doesn't appear to me to be uh, systemic, but whenever banking is involved and, and you see an unexpected loss, it, it certainly is on their radar, and I'm sure it is. Rich, as you know, as we know, a lot of thought goes into the language that gets put in this statement. That line, greater confidence. A lot of people are going to stress test that line, greater confidence, for the next one month or so. Neil Dutter, our good friend over at Renaissance Macro, writes in, what exactly does greater confidence mean? Can you talk to us about that, Rich? What do you think greater confidence means? And I'm going to ask this question just to wind up TK. Is it one CPI print? Is it two? <laughs> is it three? Rich, what is it? Well, I think, you know, at the risk of exaggeration, you might have 19 opinions on that on the committee. I think the center of gravity, though, look, the price inflation numbers have been moving in a very good uh, direction. Six months now, uh, core inflation or Dallas Fed measures are definitely close to 2%. Uh, percent. But we do have an economy in which wage inflation is running about a point hotter than probably they think would be uh, consistent with the long run goal. So I think implicitly they'll be looking at a number of indicators from the labor market. We got some good news today uh, on ECI, but even with that, ECI is still probably about a point hotter than they would ultimately like to see. Rich Clarida measured. I'm going to associate it with Alan Greenspan. You yes. may want to take it back further. But I'm sorry, we are slaves to measured in our great fear of becoming unanchored. We have regret. We're worried about the Bank of Japan. I believe it was back in the early 2000s. We need to be measured. How do we be measured after this pandemic and after this original economics? Not surprisingly, good, good question there, because uh, measured was used by the maestro in, in 04 to talk about a measured pace of rate increases, but, but certainly now it may enter the conversation once they start uh, to cut. And I think here you do see the tug of war. Folks look at past history. They see that when the Fed starts to cut, it cuts very fast and in big chunks uh, oftentimes. Typically, if you go back and look, Tom, in soft landings, and what turn out to be soft landings, it looks a lot different, more like two or three uh, cuts, 75 basis points or so. So I think a lot of the measured uh, in this cycle on the down direction is going to depend upon how soft the landing is. The, you know, Jay Powell thinks the runway for a soft landing's in sight, but right now that's a forecast. So it will be data dependent. Sorry, that's a cop out, but, but I do think <laughs> that it will be data dependent. Can the Fed afford to be Sounds measured? Like a Fed <laughs> I mean, can the Fed afford to be measured and start later if we're also bumping up against a political sil uh, silly season, as Tom would say? This has become uh, something that more and more economists are looking at. Why not start earlier, go more slowly and be less susceptible to becoming a political football? Yeah. <clears throat> Great, great point. It is an election year. I, I noticed historically, and I, you can confirm this on your Bloomberg uh, terminal, the Fed, historically, the Fed has moved in election years and both up uh, and down. So I think the Powell Fed will do what it needs to do this year in terms of adjusting rates, presumably downward. But I do agree with you, Lisa, you know, if you think you're going to cut three times, say, which was what the December SEP was, certainly it would make sense right. to get that process going, you know, perhaps in the summer and not wait till uh, November, shall we say. To dovetail with the academics of Richard Clarida joining us now from the Midwest, Diane Swank of Michigan, Chief Economist, KPMG. Uh, really pleased to have you here, Diane. Let me get away from the monetary mumbo jumbo, Diane. You are expert on the pulse of corporate America on this technology overlay we've witnessed. Look at the profits of Microsoft yesterday and also on this new change in productivity. Does this Federal Reserve have any understanding of the new productive America? I think they do. I think they're watching it very carefully. What the question is, is it something that's sustainable? And, you know, this is why I agree 100 percent with Rich, the measured concept, because I think the markets really want to see much more aggressive rate cuts and the Fed. I think they start in May. But I think what's important about it is they start before the second half of the year, or before we really get into the summer. And I think that's going to be justifiable. But I, I really think it's important to understand what's going on in terms of 
productivity growth picked up in part because people are not quitting jobs as much. They're learning the jobs they had. We're also finally leveraging all that technology that we took on as we pivoted online. That's all good news. The question is, how sustainable is it? And I think that's something the Fed still hasn't figured out. And that's what we're going to see in the minutes. I mean, it's really interesting to me that the December meeting when Powell came out and had a much more dovish tone and was pretty excited and markets got pretty excited (laughs) off of it. Comments. The actual minutes to the meeting were that, you know, hey, we're worried that inflation risks are to the upside. And so it'll be really interesting to see the minutes off this meeting in terms of how they see the productivity growth continuing in 2024. And, you know, it's a cop out. The Fed gets to be able to react and be data dependent. And Rich is absolutely right about that. But that's what they're going to do. They're looking at a meeting by meeting basis. And I think, you know, we'll have enough information by May and June to begin those cuts. But I think that measured side of it is also really important because the markets really want to take off and put a lot more cuts in than the Fed is really willing to do. It was a really bizarre sequence to have the chairman engage in a conversation about interest rate cuts. Then New York Fed President John Williams come out and say, not really talking about rate cuts. And then the minutes seem to back up Williams <laughs> and not Powell. Diane, we'll let that go. Let's see if they repeat it again. I think, Diane, today there's a feeling they are going to engage in a conversation a little bit more openly about the timing of interest rate reductions. Do you think they need to draw a clear distinction between adjusting rates and easing policy? Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure Rich would agree with me. I mean, this is removing the restriction, but not trying to stimulate the economy. And I think that's very important. They're trying to normalize rates. They're not trying to stimulate a moribund economy. And that's a very different scenario, as was pointed out, from a soft landing and what may be at the moment an extremely soft landing. We also know that, you know, we're kind of coming in really strong in the first quarter on consumer spending. Even with January and some weather disruptions, it don't you don't need much consumer spending for it to be very robust in the first quarter. And that's something the Fed's very attentive to right now as well. So in the press conference, most certainly, uh, Rich, there's going to be someone who comes up and asks uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell, so how much did you guys talk about rate cuts? Did you throw out dates? Did you throw out what your criteria are? If you were on the Fed, what would you hope he would say? How granular should they be, given the fact that people know they're talking about it? They have to be talking about it. Everybody else is talking about it. How much do they really uh, telegraph to the market? Times, Lisa, when um, the press conference is, um, you know, moving beyond what was in the, the, the statement, sometimes because the chair wants to move in that direction or because you've got a divided committee. I think today, and of course we'll find out in 2.30, I think today is a day when, when the chair on that question in particular will hug the <coughs> FOMC statement pretty closely because it, it was a big change from December. Some of it was expected. Some of it was a little bit more hawkish. And so Knowing Jay Powell, I think today will be a day when he gets a question like that, he will hug the, the FOMC statement language pretty, pretty uh, uh, tightly. That's what you do with Bramo questions. Just hold on to the statement, try and ignore the question. <laughs> I just wonder how many times they shared the love letter from Senate Banking Committee Chair Sherrod Brown and the letter from Senator Elizabeth Warren and her Democratic colleagues. Rich, you've got experience of this under the Trump administration. It's often, and I'll say it for you, it was inappropriate then, it's inappropriate now. How did you deal with it then? How do you suspect this FOMC will deal with it now? As you see lines like this from senators down in Washington, D.C., that I urge the Federal Reserve to ease monetary policy early this year. How do you deal with that, Rich? Um, it, obviously, we had to deal with it uh, in a different uh, context, but it goes, it goes way, way back. And I think Fed institutionally and Jay Powell individually <laughs> understands uh, the stakes. And, and I think he just thinks this is just part, part of the job and, and the Fed will the Fed will look right. through it. And of course, the data is breaking in a direction where that completely reinforces it. Richard Clarida, though, this is a good time to mention, of course, this is your public service to the nation is with Jon Snow and Treasury, Paul O'Neill, and your work, of course, as vice chair, recently anointed by the Museum of American Finance with the Whitehead Award. And I'm going to go back there to Paul Volcker and others. I'm sorry, Richard Clarida, at the end of the day, you were teaching politics 101 at Columbia. This Fed has to go into an election cycle no one watching or listening has ever seen. How political does the Fed get, say, Labor Day? I think the Powell Fed will not be political, but it's inevitable monetary policy will be pulled into 
the political presidential discussion. I think they're prepared for it. And I think they have decided or they're deciding what they think they need to do based on the economics. And when they're ready to go, they'll they'll communicate it. I'm confident they'll they'll succeed. But I don't I don't disagree that there is going to be uh, enhanced emphasis and focus and, and, and a political element to the focus on this. In the meantime, there's a real question, Diane, about what exactly greater confidence means, as John was talking about earlier. What metrics are you looking at? I was struck by doom spending, which, of course, ca caught my eye. But some of these areas that might be distorted because of changes post pandemic, what gives you the clearest read? Well, I think you're just going to have to continue on the labor market and inflation. Those are the two most important things. Those are the two most important data points to the Federal Reserve, and that's what they're going to be watching. I want to just echo something that, you know, Rich said. You know, we've seen Powell go through some pretty hard political times already, and he's proven himself to be an institutionalist with the Fed on that. And I think that's a positive thing. The, ho the Fed doesn't have a horse in this race. That said, they will be blamed for no matter what they do, no matter what. And they know that. And I think that's what Rich is telling you. And that's, you know, that doesn't mean their decisions are going to be influenced by it. It just means that they know how to go through the hailstorm that's about to, to hit them. That said, they're looking for continued improvement in inflation and continued improvement in services inflation. I think they're going to get it. And I think they will be moving by May. But the bottom line is they want to see that continued improvement. And they're also watching the consumer out there pretty closely because this has been a remarkable, not only resilient consumer, a defiant consumer showing just how strong they really are. Diane, Mike McKee is still listening before he goes into that news conference. Questions for Chairman Powell. What are they now? The biggest questions are, you know, how do you talk about what is what is that exact issue is what does this mean when you guys feel confident enough to cut rates what is going to be the criteria that's what all the focus is going to be on and my guess is he's going to talk about it very vaguely and that's the problem for financial markets because they want something concrete and this is when you get and ask Rick rich about it but you get yep. to the hard part between monetary policy as a science or an art this is the art at the moment diane thank you Diane Swank there on the latest. Let's reset here. If you are just joining us live on TV and radio, it is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance, The Fed Decides. The news conference is in about 13 minutes' time. We had the decision about 17 minutes ago. No change on interest rates. They dropped this bias towards further tightening. There's this new line we need to talk about. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably towards 2%. So this is the market response to all of this. You record the market this afternoon looks like this on the S&P 500, down by 0.9%. We're down 1.3 on the Nasdaq. Lisa, in the bond market, yields lower by eight or nine basis points. Not session lows on bond yields, I have to say. This move faded just a touch. So the market is looking at the Federal Reserve, hoping they inch towards interest rate cuts. They're kind of taking a baby step today, but not fully embracing the idea just yet. The fact that they sort of said there's still a prolonged period of time before we reach our inflation targets to uh, cast some cold water. There's still more people out there who thought maybe we'd get a cut at this meeting, right? That it was a live meeting. We heard some people saying that's what they should do, right? This casts some serious cold water on it. I love the idea of what we're going to hear from Jay Powell. Absolutely nothing. He will hug that statement. He will say as little as possible. He will be as ambiguous as possible. Just wait for it. I think we could get a surprise like last time. And I think uh, Diane Swank was absolutely right about the science and the art. John, we're coming out of a pandemic. The great missed call last year was economic growth. Where were we 12 months ago? Doom, gloom. Totally. Now it. Total, just total gloom. Everybody was wrong. Plain, I was wrong. Everybody else was Lisa's wrong. Lisa's taking this personally you know, right now. Oh, I know okay. she is. Turn it down. You know, it's, it's okay. great in the new studio. The Brahma <laughs> cam looks beautiful. But the, the point here, John, is it is an art. They're making it up as they go after this massive pandemic and massive stimulus. So I think today is less predictable because I was humbled last press conference. Tom, it's important to pause here, and I'm pleased you've brought it up. It's important to pause and go over where we were, where we thought we'd be, and where we actually are. <clears throat> Where we are right now is unemployment sat the 4%. Inflation's doing better. Core PCE last week, we were talking about a two-handle, not a three, which is a massive change as well. And GDP, Tom, growth held up in the face of interest rates climbing aggressively. Now, this is not a judgment about where we're going. 
This is just an observation about where we are. And where we are is so much better than where we thought we'd be 12 months it ago. It's been one on one. I mean, forget about measured. We have a stock market which is voting every day, every tick. And I believe since October has been on a tear. They have to fold that into the debate as Just well. pulling back from all time highs. Robert Tipp is with us of PG Fixed Income alongside the former Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarida. Robert Tipp, you've had about 20 minutes to go over this one. Your reaction to it? Sure. Yeah. You know, where we are versus where we expected. I mean, we did not have a backdrop for a recession. Interest rates were raised for a reason. Uh, the system had a clean backdrop. It was not one of these backdrops that was going to crumble when interest rates were raised. It uh, continued right through SVB. The economy has plowed through. And uh, the Fed is fine tuning the policy at this point. Now, they started off with the first notion of cutting rates. I mean, arguably back in July, Powell talked about how they would not wait for 2% inflation. They'll be cutting way ahead of that. Now, September saw a huge U-turn. So they were fine tuning with maybe like a chainsaw at that point. December, uh, you know, they came in and we had a U-turn and a U-turn, frankly, before that in October, they called an audible as rates went up to 5% and they started to talk down their own higher for longer. At this point, they're really balanced. Uh, the market wants to get 200 basis points ahead of them, which is actually kind of understandable. The 5.3% Fed funds rate they're running right now is a long way from the 2.5% that they're putting forward as neutral. And inflation is hundreds of basis points off its highs and pretty sustainably, uh, you know, is down in the threes, if not down at target right now for about six months. So their comments, you know, suggest they want to see a few more months. Or right. maybe uh, a big team of them want to see another six months before they go. Robert, from the parlor game, let's go to what you and Greg Peters do every day, which you've got to be in the market. Are you being in the market, clipping the coupon, or can you actually still pop a good total return this year? Yeah, I think big picture, the market is going to clip a good return. I think that your, your spread products, you know, as we've said, uh, starting off, uh, put out a piece at the end of 2022, yield is destiny. You are going to clip that coupon. But we've seen the market 75, 100 basis points uh, on either side uh, of uh, 4%, roughly. And I think we're going to continue to see these big swings. Right now, the market wants to go in the dovish direction. Uh, but this Powell Fed is aware that the second big move higher in inflation in the 70s came with uh, hostilities in the Mideast with volatility in the Middle East and a big increase in oil prices. And we have full employment around the world. Uh, we've seen very high inflation that brought about higher wages. All of that is in retrograde right now. They're going to want to make sure they have that really uh, under control before they, they turn aggressively here. It's a good point, Robert, and I expect that we will hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. They are watching the, uh, the issues and the conflict in the Middle East carefully. Rich Clarida, one thing that was really notable about the December press conference was that Fed Chair Jay Powell had an opportunity to push back against that rosy outlook, the sort of flooding into risk assets that Robert Tipp was talking about and that so many people have embraced. He didn't push back. Do you think it's going to be the same at this press conference that he will just say, ultimately, the markets will do what we want, what they want to do. We're watching something else and we're on a good glide path. Again, I think this is going to be a press conference where it will make sense for the chair to to really hug that FOMC statement. There was a lot of red ink. It was there for a reason. It gave the message uh, that, you know, basically trying to dissuade folks from pricing in that March adjustment and talk about they want to see the considerable and additional evidence. And so I, I think that's a pretty good place for him to, to spend most of the day, at least on those sorts of, uh, of, of questions. I have to say, Rich, you're not hyping up this news conference at all. It sounds like <laughs> well, Chairman Powell on repeat. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty, though. Robert Tip, just finally, I'm getting a load of people right in to say, what's the trade? What's your favorite trade right now, Robert, after what you've just heard? Yeah, I think that it's, it's not that whether the cuts priced in are correct or not. I think it's the timing and the shape of the curve. Uh, the ends of the curve, you know, whether you're looking at the, the next six months or whether you're looking at the, the 10 year or the 30 year point, those look re more reasonably priced than some of your uh, two-year-out interest rates that are really banking on 
uh, 200 basis points of, of interest rate cuts in, in the next you know, 18 months. And uh, I think if you can stay in the market and clip that coupon, uh, avoid rolling up the yield curve and also make some money on the tactics of trading this wide range on rates, uh, I think it's going to be a very good year for bonds. Robert Tip, thank you, sir, from Peachim on the latest from the Federal Reserve. For more, here's Bank of America's Mike Gapin, the chief economist. Mike, you've got the Fed going in March. Do you like what you hear today? Are we making that closer step, another baby step towards your call? We are. I think you can interpret the statement as, as saying risks to the outlook are balanced, therefore our guidance should be balanced. And, and then did we debate a rate cut today? Yes, we did, just not for very long. What we need is more confidence before, before we cut rates. And, and I do think that involves seeing more progress on services inflation and more progress on, on wages. Because as you know, a lot of the disinflation has come from goods prices. Those declines may not persist. So the Fed will see more of that data. I think they can get there by right. March. So I'd say the statement was, was broadly in line with our thinking. Michael Gapin, how aggregated are we or disaggregated? Are there two Americas out there, an America flat on its back, and then the prosperous Americas witnessed by Microsoft's profit yesterday? Yeah, there is, you know, the, the economy is bifurcate, bifurcated. I think more broadly, you could just say, you know, industrials and goods versus services. The industrial side of the economy has been suffering. Regional banks, obviously, with news headlines this morning, still continue to struggle. But the consumer's in good shape. The services side of the economy is doing well. Tech earnings are doing well. It has been kind of a, a rolling recessionary story where certain segments of the economy have had problems at different points in time, but the economy overall has, has powered through. So thinking about it in that way, Tom, I think makes a lot of sense. Michael, I love hearing the bustle and the hustle behind you. And I imagine everybody's saying the balance of risks. How do we get the greater confidence that inflation is coming down? What does that mean? So what do you what think that, that mean? means <laughs> in terms of how much you've got to uh, get in terms of data under belt? So I think they can get there by March in the following way and that they'll, they'll get February PCE and they'll get the CPI and the PPI um, for that next PCE, I'm sorry, the January PCE, but then they'll get CPI and PPI for that February PCE print during the blackout period. So they'll have two more inflation reports. They'll get more uh, information on where is services inflation, where is shelter. They'll get more wage data in the next two employment reports. I really think it's about that side of the ledger for some on the committee. For Governor Waller, he says the components don't matter. I just look at inflation. So his bar may be, may be lower, but others are really kind of concerned about that good services trade-off and worry that services are too sticky. In a word, optionality. It's written this way because right. it can mean whatever they want it to mean, Lisa, at any time over the next few months. Which is the reason why he's going to hug that statement so there close and everyone's going to be happy. And then <laughs> you know, really someday, someday I'm going to read a statement or read the minutes and it's going to say in there, it is written. <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to actually say it in there from Gaines. Richard Clarity, let's come to you and just wind things up and put a bow on it if we can. This has been a single mandate central bank for the last couple of years with a focus on inflation and getting it back down towards 2%. Can we talk about the other side of the dual mandate? Is there anything to worry about in the labor market from your perspective? It, the labor market in, is in a very good place. If anything, it, it, it's, it's running a little hot. Uh, and I, but I do think there's a path for that to adjust uh, uh, un, under the under the outlook. So, yeah, the labor market is, you know, that's what we want. Maximum employment. We're at perhaps a little bit more than maximum employment. But but wage inflation is decelerating. We saw in the ECI. And I think that that's what they're factoring in for this year. Continuing that. Michael Gapin, do you agree? I do. I would say if concerns would be about the dispersion of employment growth, which is pretty narrow, focused in leisure and hospitality and education and health, and then remaining growth in the private sector is basically flat. But I, I agree with Rich. The labor market's in, uh, in a good place, and it's helping to, to drive the outlook. Mike, I know you've got to run. It's great to get you called. Cool. Michael Gapin there of Bank of America looking for a March interest rate reduction. Richard Clarida, thank you, sir. And congratulations on that Whitehead Award. Truly prestigious, sir. We appreciate your time.